My name is Scott McDaniel, as uh, Rich said earlier, I'm the executive director of Susquehanna Wildlife Society. Um, and we are a 501c3, a nonprofit, and our focus is the lower Susquehanna region uh, and the surrounding areas. So we, we really set out to have a very specific focus. Um, we are based in Maryland. We do a lot um, that has to do with Maryland in general, but we really want to focus in on this watershed that in a lot of ways we feel is kind of forgotten. You know, the Chesapeake Bay, understandably so, gets a lot of attention as it needs to. But the river that feeds it, that it, you know, is, is kind of formed over top of essentially, uh, a lot of people don't talk about. A lot of people, if you don't live in Hartford, Cecil County, you don't really pay much attention to it other than driving over on 95 and up to Philadelphia or, or points north or east. So, uh, you know, we had this giant uh, river with all these ecosystems that are really important that were surrounding it. Uh, we had these rare animals that were found in this ecosystem and these tributaries and these headwaters uh, that's, that were feeding this river. And we just really felt like uh, also, you know, the backyard uh, mentality of, you know, we wanted to save animals and habitat and advocate for things that we cared about in our own backyards that were of importance to us. And we felt like a lot of people, um, you know, it's kind of a natural progression, but things like the whales and the sea turtles and the pandas get a lot of attention. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize they have endangered species within 10 miles of their house. Um, I grew up in Carroll County where uh, there were bog turtle population and I was a turtle kid obsessed with turtles. Uh, I never seen one. I really didn't know anything about them except for uh, I heard some stories that there were these little tiny rare turtles somewhere not far from my house. Um, most people will never see them their entire life. You know, in Hartford County, we also have the Maryland darter, which is a potentially extinct, but uh, if not the rarest fish probably in the world is only found in one riffle and one stream um, and nowhere else in the world. So we have these special places, you know, and these special ecosystems I really love. So we really wanted to base our organization kind of around that. Um, and with that, as I'll go into, uh, you know, research, education and rescue kind of build into our conservation uh, framework that we focus on. So um, we'll get more into all these things, but you know, these are the pillars kind of here at research. So we don't want to just rely completely on other, other research, existing research. We wanted to go out and do some of it ourselves, learn more about these habitats, these ecosystems, um, these animals that were potentially overlooked. Uh, in education, I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if someone has to mute their... Uh, is everybody on mute right now? Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, so education, that's a big uh, part of our mission is just talking about these animals, trying to advocate for things. Uh, we helped uh, put an end to the frog and turtle derby that used to go on in Bel Air and, and, and affect Maryland. It's now illegal to race native frogs or turtles in Maryland. Uh, that was going on for some decades with a lot of resistance uh, that was put to an end. So that was a win for local wildlife and disease spread and things like that. Um, we did a lot of work with advocating for not killing snakes and helping turtles and understanding, you know, rainy nights like this in the spring, you know, be, the roads will be packed with frogs and salamanders and kind of looking out for those sorts of things. And then rescue. So we actually do hands-on rescue. So we get calls uh, from folks in the community on our hotline and we either talk them through it, tell them where to take something, or we respond and go actually rescue these animals in need. You know, everything from turtles to eagles, uh, vultures, which like to vomit on you uh, uh, to give thanks for your efforts. Um, and then uh, owls and raccoons and all sorts of things. So we try to be kind of a one-stop shop for wildlife in our, in our area. And then of course, conservation. So a lot of these rare kind of threatened or just more unusual, maybe lesser seen animals, um, uh, unpopular animals, so to speak. So things like coyotes that people don't like, we try to give a voice for them and uh, help people understand them a little better. So um, kind of the culmination of that, uh, sorry, this little graphics moved out of the way, but um, the Susquehanna Wildlife Center. So as Rich mentioned, we have a 20 acre site uh, in Darlington, Maryland that we've been renovating for about six years now. 
as a small group, mostly volunteers. Besides me, I'm the only employee, uh, and that's only been for the last several years. But uh, we're actually building a, a center where folks can come out, learn about wildlife, uh, learn about uh, best practices for things they can do in their own yards, churches, places of business, things like that. So uh, we wanted to have a place that wouldn't be a park per se, because you know parks are essentially for people, as most of you probably know, and that's a great thing. Uh, but we wanted a place that's sole purpose is for wildlife. So we do have things of uh, passive recreation, such as hiking, um, small trails that go through areas to not disturb the habitat, lots of um, restorations and things on the habitat itself that we could show people uh, as well as research was kind of our primary focus there. Uh, in our building, we will have um, certain elements um, in the building that will allow for people to come, school groups, things like that, and visit and learn more about wildlife. Uh, but you can also see here, we've done some habitat restorations on the property. We have pawpaw groves and a, a really nice meadow restoration that we turned an old pasture into a meadow. And uh, for pollinators and all sorts of wildlife that benefit from grasslands, which are one of our kind of more rare and forgotten uh, habitats in Maryland that you don't see nearly as much of as we used to have. And they're really critical. We've seen a lot of declines in wildlife because of them. Uh, also things like artificial snake dens and all these kind of fun little uh, kind of uh, experimental habitats that we're trying to create on the property just to see how we can benefit wildlife uh, by doing these sorts of things. One of our, um, what Rich mentioned earlier about having a rare species on the property. Uh, so our, our rare kind of threatened species that was kind of the impetus for protecting this site was the Baltimore checkerspot butterfly, which is our state insect, as many of you probably know but it relies on the uh, white turtle head plant. So uh, kind of a wetland plant that has been commonly mowed down by deer, overgrazing deer, overpopulated deer, uh, herds, um, as well as uh, climate change, which is a big factor of the species. It appears to be moving northward uh, in its range as temperatures rise. Um, it's more of a cold weather, uh, New England, Great Lakes, Upland, uh, Appalachian species that happen to live in Maryland too, but it's, its range is retracting rather rapidly. So we brought back uh, a hand, uh, several dozen uh, caterpillars last year to our site after planting um, several hundred of their coast plants. And we're actively uh, managing that species now and trying to see if they can be actually restored to a site that has uh, had them probably in the past and has lost them. So that's one of the, the kind of key elements of our property. Also things like stargazing platform, um, an outdoor turtle enclosure. I will get more to reptiles in a second, I promise. Um, so we're going to have displays uh, out for folks and kids to come by and, and see some of these native species on display. So we built this. These are all animals that were uh, couldn't be released, uh, were confiscated or um, born in captivity. So we don't take anything out of the wild for turtles or anything like that. So. Um, and then this is kind of a mock up of our inside our exhibit area so we'll have all focus on a lot of it will be reptiles and amphibians actually um, the species found in the lowers Susquehanna and their habitats. So kind of um, to get to the reptile angle is uh, kind of how our organization formed was right before we started, uh, we were coordinators uh, for Hartford County. Uh, for the MARA project, the Maryland um, Amphibian Reptile Atlas. So there was a statewide effort that some of you may have participated in where you um, folks would send us records, uh, photos and locations of reptiles and amphibians from Hartford County. And then there were different coordinators for every county across the state. So this five-year project occurred to kind of map out like where these species were now found. We found some new locations some new species were discovered. Uh, along the way, not new species to science, but new to Maryland or new to certain counties. Um, and then uh, some had retracted the range, as you can imagine, over since the 1970s when the last survey was done. Um, so that was kind of the impetus of our, of our organization where we're like, okay, we reached out to the public, we're talking about reptiles and amphibians, we're educating about them, we're doing research, and that kind of gave us a framework to kind of build this nonprofit out of it. So from there, um, we started really educating folks about these animals and um, about uh, you know how how they can actually help so one of the things that we talk a lot about is you know how can you as uh, as a resident of the state uh, you know help wildlife and one of the things that connects a lot of people to wildlife you know most of us don't get the opportunity to pick a bald eagle up off the road and 
transport it to a rehabilitator or anything like that. But uh, probably every one of you has found a turtle on the road at some point in your life. Um, it seems like we used to have more, obviously, of a lot of these species. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to find box turtles all the time on the roads, and it's certainly become less and less as time has moved on. But um, helping turtles move in the direction that they're heading. It's very simple, uh, but helping turtles the direction they're going because they are very stubborn animals, like a lot of us people, um, and they want to go a certain direction. And if you help them that way, they can keep going on. If you put them back the opposite direction, they'll often turn around and go back into the road when you leave, even though you feel good about your efforts, it may be for, for nothing. So um, that's one of the things we really started pushing early on was like, okay, here's what you do. Here's the best kind of advice. And here's uh, a little action that you can take um, that makes a big deal. Now, each turtle that you help cross the road, uh, if you think about it, especially if it's a female, that one female may lay, you know, say 10 eggs a year, um, could be more depending on the species or less, but say 10 a year, say one or two of those um, hatchlings survives, makes it to adulthood. Now there's more turtles and then they breed and then they breed, then they breed. So people used to always say, well, I'm taking this turtle as a pet because I wanna rescue it or save it. Uh, now every turtle that, that gets hit by a car or gets taken out of the wild, um, and we'll talk about uh, collection and poaching in a minute, but um, you know, you're actually really hurting that population. You're really impacting it by taking even just one turtle that people think, oh, it's just one, it's not significant, but that one turtle can live for 50, 60 years, some cases, hundred years. Uh, that's a lot of baby turtles um, that you're removing from the ecosystem. You're not just removing that one turtle, you're removing quite a, quite a bit, so. So, you know, with that, of course, is the, the big and scary one, the snapping turtle. And uh, we talked to people about how to pick them up and it's by the rear of the shell. Um, you can pick them up by the rear of the shell uh, away from their, their head and their claws. Um, a lot of people just do it really close to the ground or they'll put them in a rubber made container or onto a, a floor mat of their car and drag them across the road. Uh, obviously snap turtles can be very dangerous if you're not careful, with their heads and their claws. Um, but we've, we've rescued many a snapping turtle. They're incredible creatures that get a really bad reputation. So uh, even the big so-called scary ones uh, we do advocate for. So one of the big things about um, turtles and specifically, and it, we focus a lot more on turtles just because we happen to have one of the largest uh, diversity of turtles in our lower Susquehanna region in the whole state. Uh, and a lot of the turtles are um, declining and, and dealing with a lot of threats more than almost any other species really. Um, you know, so they get hit by cars, they get things like hooks stuck in them. You can see here in this x-ray. Um, one of the big issues right now is nest predation. So you have raccoons, foxes, coyotes, skunks, crows um, that will actually dig up and eat their eggs. So there's some population of turtles where they've, raccoons have learned where the turtles nest and mother raccoons will teach their young where to find these snacks uh, in the early summer every year. Uh, and it gets passed down and entire nesting beaches of turtles have been wiped out year after year. So it is a big problem and it creates quite a dilemma for us wildlife lovers because, you know, we like raccoons and foxes too, of course. They are natural, they're native to here, um, but they're what we call subsidized predators. So because of human activity, these animals have done incredibly well. Um, they have food, uh, they've adapted really, really well to our environment or human altered environments. So we have a situation where you have a rare declining species that can't handle that much pressure uh, and destruction. And then you have a species that's flourishing to the point where there's so many that they're out of balance. And we don't have things like cougars and wolves to control raccoon and fox populations like we used to. So that creates a problem. So turtle biologists are constantly faced with things like, you know, do we remove raccoons? And when you say remove, it means, you know, eliminate them from that population. So we don't, do, we haven't done that ourselves, but that is something that we have to constantly face and try to figure out a solution for because um, if one species disappear and the other one's thriving and it's because of us, you know, there is some, uh, some reasoning that says that we need to do something about that. So we also have things like disease often spread by humans. Uh, and I promise this won't be all depressing, um, but uh, 
Uh, Ranavirus is a big one that has wiped out lots of population. It goes through a lot of uh, amphibian breeding habitats and then it, it uh, transfers to turtles like box turtles. Uh, look at these swollen eyes. It's, it's kind of been called like the Ebola of, uh, of these uh, turtles because it, it affects them very quickly. It's very destructive. Um, they can be cured uh, if caught quick enough, early enough, but it's that's rare. Usually by the time you find them, it's too late. Uh, it tends to be environmental stresses. So I'm sure a lot of you folks talk about how habitat destruction, fragmentation is bad because of the habitat displacement, but it also creates stress in a lot of these animals. So when their habitat's reduced and there's too many of an animal in one single area, it can create a lot of stress. And then it makes it easier for them to catch diseases and get sick from those things when they're weakened or stressed out. Scott, on the ranavirus, other diseases, you got my email about a Senate bill that we all should support to prevent new diseases from coming across through wildlife trade. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't. And can you share that, that. Everybody and, and comment on it? That would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. Thank so, um, uh, yeah, if we, uh, you know, looking at these animals in the pet trade and things like that, these two diseases that spread into these populations, a lot of these animals. Um, the pet trade in general, you know, if people want to keep a pet and it's born in captivity and it's coming from a breeder, um, that's not so much of an issue. But when these people are taking animals from the wild, um, these poachers are going out and collecting animals in huge numbers. Um, they're bringing in exotic animals and then people don't want them anymore. So they're releasing them back into the wild. And that creates uh, a big issue for diseases. If you look at a lot of our species, the American chestnut, you know, um, you look at the lantern flies. Um, that we're dealing with right now, um, chytrid fungus, a lot of these other diseases and things, um, they come because we're bringing, you know, we have a global trade now and we're bringing different things into the country, out of the country. Uh, and we do the same thing to other countries, you know, there's bullfrogs in Europe and all of the world red sliders that are in, you know, displacing native species uh, all around the world. So it, it is a problem, you know, people get pet, um, oops, sorry. Uh, people get pets and they say, oh yeah, I want this cute turtle as a pet. And then what happens is they, um, they get bored with them. You know, a kid grows up, they go to college, whatever. Um, and people say, oh, let's let them back in the wild. They don't realize that the animal has never been in the wild um, and it's not suited for it. It might have diseases, might be sickly. Um, it's being released. It might not be native to the area. So that's a pretty, pretty big problem we deal with a lot. We find a lot of animals in the wild. We found Chinese soft shell turtle on uh, the Bush River here in Hartford County, which is typically less common in the pet trade, more common in the fish markets. So people will go in, they'll buy these turtles to try to save them because seeing them being used as food uh, in like Asian markets and things like that, uh, where they're a little more popular um, with certain cultures. So uh, people say, oh, I'm gonna get this turtle and save it. And they let it go. And this animals, you know, traveled overseas. It could have who knows what diseases that aren't you know, part of this ecosystem and it causes a lot of problems. So we tell people, you know, a lot of reptiles are really hard to keep in captivity. They're, they're very um, much harder pets to have than a lot of other uh, animals out there. So um, it's a big commitment. You really got to know what you're getting into. They can live for 50, 60 years in captivity. Um, depending on the species, they require a lot of expensive lighting and food, things like that, big, big aquariums. So, uh, you know, it's a big, it's a big commitment. So it shouldn't be taken lightly. And then, of course, road mortality we talked about already. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, this is one of my favorite species. Um, does anyone have any questions before I move on? Uh, I don't see the chat. So let me just double check real quick. Uh, OK, no new chats. Everybody good? OK. So the bog turtle. So this is a species, and we're talking about rare, threatened, endangered species in Maryland. To me, this is one of the highlights, uh, and it, it really speaks to a lot as it pertains to how our landscape has changed, right? So this species requires these uh, wet sedge meadow habitats. And what those are, are actually where springheads are source water, um, our headwaters. So we talk a lot about Chesapeake Bay and pollution, things like that. This is where the bay actually starts. So this is where water actually comes up out of the ground from the, from the water table and it saturates this organic soil. So 
the soils that are full of just dead plants from, you know, decades, centuries, millennia, whatever it might be, um, these dead plants falling back into this, this wet soil um, and saturating it and keeping it wet. Um, the soil is mucky. It's very uh, <laughs> inhospitable to someone that's not used to it. Uh, it can be two, three foot deep mud um very hard to move through it can be like a floating mat of vegetation almost like you would think um that, you know they call them bog turtles but they're actually more uh accurately probably called a fen turtle so a fen is these habitats these wet meadows that are spring fed a bog is um is uh filled with rainwater. so we do have bogs in maryland and other places but not the habitat where bog turtles live typically isn't a true bog typically there's uh, groundwater infiltration, not just straight uh, rain fed uh, kind of real acidic um, type of habitat, at least in Maryland. There are, there are some bogs throughout their range um, where these turtles might live, but uh, fens are much more common habitat for them. And what you'll see is this little tiny turtle that digs in the mud, that hides in the mud. It's incredibly hard to find. Um, it's incredibly small. Like I said, it's the smallest turtle in North America. Um, and its habitat has really um, really changed a lot. So um, you can see here us working with Scott Smith, who's the uh, uh, state uh, wildlife ecologist that's focused on bog turtles since the 90s. And uh, we've been gifted uh, with the opportunity to go out with DNR and help them with their, their surveys. This is a federally threatened and state threatened species. In many states where they're found, they're actually endangered probably actually endangered in Maryland. It's a kind of a technicality depending on the number of meta populations and things like that. But the species has blinked out of many of their former occupied wetlands, uh, even over the last 30 years here in Maryland. So we talk about the history. So if you look at this map, um, the, the kind of the gray on the map, this is from US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, is where they still are found. And that map looks like, oh, they're actually pretty widespread. Look at all that gray. Um, it really should be little tiny dots because almost their entire range is full of these little tiny dots where there's, you know, there might be one wetland and then another mile, there might be another wetland, then 10 miles from there, there might be one more, then maybe a hundred miles from there is another one. So this, you know, in certain pockets, there's quite a few little populations, but you can go a, quite a long way without seeing any um, suitable habitat. Can you explain what a meta population is? Sure. Sure. Um, so a meta population is pretty much a collection of multiple populations. So you might have a wetland here, a wetland there, and they might be within, say they're within a half mile of each other. These turtles will move a good bit. A lot of turtles will move, you know, even up to a mile and some, some even more in some cases, but usually it's not that far, but um, we've had turtles at sites move, you know, a quarter mile and we find them because we marked them. If you saw in the previous picture, you know, we're actually filing little notches in these turtle shells and they're, they're intentional. Each notch is a part of a code system. So the number of notches and where they are on the turtle, and it doesn't really hurt the turtle to do it. And they're agitated when you're doing it, but you only really have to do it uh, once and maybe touch them up every so often. But um, we notch them so that they don't have to be, um, you know, they're not painted or anything like that. These little notches can uh, indicate which turtle we have. And then we re refer back to these databases where we say, okay, this turtle was first caught in, you know, 1998, it's a male, it's the size, and we can track that turtle every time we find it uh, until it, as long as it's alive. Um, so we've found turtles that were marked at completely different sites. So um, when that happens, when there's genetic uh, movement between sites, uh, wetlands, uh, if there's turtles that can move, even if it's just possible that they can move there, they have maybe historically, the genetics have some uh, commingling. We call that a metapopulation. So metapopulations are good. And that's actually one of the things when, uh, you know, your group, for instance, talks about conservation. You know, you can't look at these islands uh, with the same value that you look at something that could potentially be a metapopulation. We talk about green infrastructure, for instance, where you're protecting you know, a park here and a conservation property here or a farm or something that's not being developed. Um, if these both have good habitat, but you don't have anything that connects the two. So it could be a stream buffer, which is pretty common. Uh, it could be a piece of green space, a forest, something where there's not just a road 
bisecting it necessarily or even if there is a road there's still forest buff around it so there might be a some peril in the middle but things can still move and birds is a lot easier because they don't have to worry as much about the roads and things like that but you want there to be connected habitat so you know we don't want to just protect islands we want to connect islands essentially if there are islands and, and that's why it's so important to protect these large swaths of land not just but also the small pieces you know because that small piece um, if you could connect to something bigger it becomes much much more important so frog turtles are are, are uh, in that category and you can see on this map um, the black areas are former uh, known bog, bog turtle habitat. Like that spot in Western Pennsylvania you see on the map, from what I've been told, um, there was a few bog turtle sites out in Western Pennsylvania, completely isolated from the rest of these sites. Um, now, a lot of this is because of glaciation. So from what I understand, you know, when we had these glaciers that moved down, you know, into Pennsylvania, then they receded, they go up and down. Every time that happened, these animals would get pushed further south, and then they kind of retreat back up to find that kind of that equilibrium where their their uh, biology kind of prefers a certain temperature range or a certain habitat, things like that. So we expect this animal is probably much more widespread at one point uh, when it was more habitat. Um, and you have sites like Western Pennsylvania, which they're not there anymore. Uh, and that's because they, you know, I think they dammed and flooded out all these wetlands and made some giant lake or something like that, or reservoir or something, who knows. But whatever was there is not there anymore as it was and this turtle is you know particularly sensitive to habitat changes it only lives in really one kind of habitat a lot of turtles are very adaptable like you know you see painted turtles i'm sure you've all seen a painted turtle a box turtle well they can live in any forest any pond any stream lake you know ditches on the side of the road they have a lot of flexibility um sediment ponds things like painted turtles and snapping turtles bog turtles only can live in these headwater uh fed wet meadows which most of them occur on farms so i think it's over 90 percent of bog turtle habitats all on private land so that's why these public private partnerships are really important these conservation easements things like that are really important you can't we can't afford to protect all these places what we have to do is is get landowners um to understand that finding an endangered species on your property does not mean the government's going to come in and take away all your rights. Um, that's something I've talked a lot at length with a lot of these biologists. Um, these partnerships are actually often beneficial to a landowner. They can get money, they can get funding for taking care of these habitats, they can get easements on their property, which goes directly into their pocket of the landowner, as long as they follow the requirements of that um, and protect these habitats. Um, but a lot of the stigma around that is, oh, no, you found endangered species. They're going to take over your property. State or the feds can come in and access your property anytime they want, which isn't true. So um, it's important that we get out and educate people that what, what it really means to have an endangered species on your property. It really should be um, a badge of honor, as far as I'm concerned, that you have such a beautiful property that you're able to host a species so sensitive as this. Um, and when I talk about habitat changes, um, you know, I put on here bison and elk because one of the ways these habitats used to be kept open, and these these can't be forested like maple swamps. That's one of the things that's happened to the species. It's actually disappeared because um, of uh, succession. So forests, you know, trees will always grow. If you have open space, there will be trees there. Birds will drop seeds, seeds will roll in, um, you know, seeds will disperse one way or another. If you have an open field, it will become trees eventually. So uh, what happened is a lot of these wetlands have gotten filled in with trees. And when it happens, they get shaded out. This turtle can no longer host its eggs. It will move out or it will die. Uh, things like maples, red maples, have become more prevalent in the landscape. And even though they're native, they've become more widespread and they dry out a lot of these wetlands. Uh, without the hydrology, these turtles cannot thrive. So it dries up the wetlands, it shades them out. So we used to have fires. We used to have bison and elk that would go in and graze these wetlands out, keep them open and sunny. So that's really an important thing um, that we've kind of lost over the years. Um, so a lot of these states have just gone beyond repair and they're just, they're already done. So the ones that still are there, you'll see, <laughs> we actually go out with the, the US Fish and Wildlife and DNR and even things like cattails that are um, native species, we might go out and cut them out. Um, and you'll see these kind of rich sedges and ferns uh, on the right photo, that's what we're really looking for in these wetlands. Open, sunny. Um, what happens is 
cattails actually become a monoculture. So uh, they'll take over a wetland. They have these really dense uh, root masses um, and their tubers and things. So they'll actually create this dense kind of choke out the wetland and it doesn't allow a lot of things to grow in it. And the turtles really don't like uh, wetlands that are just full of cattails. They can tolerate some, but you really want these open, diverse wetlands, little pockets and rivulets and this really dynamic. I mean, you go to these sites and you almost cry. It's so beautiful. I mean, it's it's lush and it's green and it's just there's so much life in these wet soils. Um, insects of all types, you know, salamanders, um, frogs, uh, birds everywhere. Birds will nest in these. We'll have all kinds of warblers nesting in some of these ve this vegetation. Uh, we'll hear owls off in the distance and all sorts of things. So. Uh, it's really a special habitat, and we hate to to see it go away uh, without management. And and that's one of the things that, um, unfortunately, I you know I used to have the mentality that we need to leave nature alone. And that's something I wanted to bring up to you all because I know all of you are really passionate about uh, protecting nature. You know, a lot of uh, the mentality out there, different schools of thought, say you know we need to get get the heck out of the way, right? Leave nature alone. Uh, let it do its thing. Nature will heal itself. Um, but uh, I think we're kind of past that point um, in a lot of ways, a lot of places, not everywhere. Interesting. We have to intervene because of all the things that we as humans have done. So it's not a matter anymore of, you know, let it go and nature will heal. Once, like I said earlier, if we do that, for instance, trees will grow because we don't have fires and herbivores that are of enough size to keep these wetlands open. Um, predators like raccoons and, and foxes will come in. So you see here, uh, this is a colleague in North Carolina I visited up in the mountains, uh, this bog turtle site. I mean, they have an electric fence around the nesting area. They have cages around each nest. Um, they were having almost 100% nest predation by rac uh, raccoons and skunks. Like the whole site would just be in two nights would have all the nests raided. So they're like, we can't allow this. We have to do something. We have to intervene in order to save the species. And now they've had hundreds of young turtles hatch and be able to be released back into the system that That's would have just cute. been eaten. Aren't they adorable? They're the cutest yes. things. <laughs> I, I absolutely love them. So uh, so pretty cool. It is, um, back real quick, um, one thing I did miss oh. to tell you guys. That's really cute. Um, so this range map, if you look at it, there's this huge gap. I think it's 500 miles of this population and they call it the southern population the northern population they actually have different regulations for these two populations so the southern population right now federally is is protected and it's being reviewed and probably will change but um the southern population network um from southern virginia with the um the biggest population in west north carolina and then it goes just into georgia there's a site in georgia that's their biggest site that's uh i interviewed for my documentary the biggest site they had was, I think, 19 animals. That was the biggest population in the whole state of Georgia. I mean, that's how rare this turtle can be. Um, and, you know, you have uh, the protection there is considered uh, similarity of appearance. So because the federal uh, agents can't, you can't tell the difference necessarily if a turtle is from, you know, Pennsylvania or North Carolina. So they've kind of protected them all, at least from collection or for sale in the pet trade, uh, based on that. Uh, that the, the ones up north are so rare that they thought that the ones down south, because there was less development in those areas, they're mostly in the mountains. You know, Piedmont right up against the mountains, so those uh, southern states there. Uh, they, th uh, they thought that they were doing a lot better than they are. And it turns out a lot of the same problems were there too. With, um, a lot of farmers, uh, Ditch. The, um, the um, I'm hearing some echo there, guys. Make sure you're here. Thanks. Um, a lot of the uh, farms that these turtles are found on, uh, they would historically ditch these wetlands too. So they would they cut these ditches to drain the wetlands uh, for you know so they can have more tillable land, so they can um, so they can have um, more space for farming and cattle grazing things like that and. A lot of these bog turtle sites, since their headwaters, actually became farm ponds too for cattle. So when you're driving up the northern counties, you know, Hartford, Cecil County, uh, Carroll County, Baltimore County, Maryland, where these turtles still exist in small numbers, if you see uh, a big farm pond with a stream coming out of it, 
a lot of times that there's headwaters. That's where the water's coming up out of the ground, feeds this big pond, and then it turns into a stream. That's where our streams start, right? Mostly. So a lot of those were historically bog turtle sites. And we also had mill dams and things like that. So a lot of the human activity over the last couple hundred years has been really detrimental to species. So uh, a lot of changes in the streams and these floodplains and things like that. Does someone have a question? Yeah. Me one. Me one. We, we did have a few questions in the chat. Oh, um, okay. okay. And also somebody posted about a bill um, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, Mark put in uh, something about a bill S2297. So that's really looks exciting. I, I asked about putting um, building wildlife crossings, you know, across roads and things like mm -hmm. that, that I know people are starting to do. Wanted to know if you had any more information on those things. And also, should we harvest some cattails and how can we know when we should? And then there's one more in there about what is the benefit that bog turtles have to the ecosystem they're in? Yeah, so um, do you mind muting it back? Can you hit me real quick? Okay, good, thank you. Um, so uh, wildlife crossings, uh, I don't know much about the bill, so I can't really speak to it. Um, I'll have to take a look at that later, but it, typically reducing um, spread of these diseases is important. And uh, we usually support that um, depending on what, what it entails. But um, wildlife crossings, um, there is one in New Jersey that I actually filmed for my documentary that um, was made specifically for bog turtles. So it connects to bog turtle wetlands and there's a road there. They were getting hit on the road. Um, so they actually built this passage and you can't just build a tunnel. You got to actually funnel them into it because otherwise they'll just go around it. So you need fences or tunnels, uh, things like that. So those do work. They tend to have um, need light through them. They don't want to just go into a dark hole. So turtles actually need to have elements of light. So either like artificial light or grates that allow the turtles to move through. And they put trail cameras inside these tunnels to actually track the turtles moving through. And uh, it has been pretty effective. So it's, you know, they really feel inclined to cross these roads, um, but they're very expensive, you know, but the idea is really getting them put into design ahead of time, you know, through legislation and things like that, um, where they're put into new highway and road projects. It's much cheaper to do it then. Doing it retrofitting later, it's really expensive. So that's why we always want to be forward thinking and try to get these things written into law where, hey, you're building a highway, you're building a road, you should put in some wildlife. And they have done it. I did the, the um, ICC, um, there was a big uh, focus on box turtles with that project, and they were really much at the forefront of thinking, how can we make this project better with turtles aren't going into the roads and get hit all the time? Um, you go to 95 to Virginia, I mean, you can see 10 dead box turtles on the road, you know, in one trip. So it, it's, a, it's a big deal. So, um, you know, the state, state Highway Administration in Maryland seems to be pretty good about thinking about these things, and um, I've heard a lot of positive um, you know, notes about some of the things they've done and some of the thinking that they have as far as, you know, planning for this stuff. Um, so harvesting cattails, I don't know a lot about that. I know people do. Um, when I'm talking about it for a bog turtle site, I mean, this is like the middle of a farm and like specific habitat, like doing it somewhere else. I mean, they grow in roadside ditches, they grow in ponds that have really little biodiversity. I mean, cattails kind of grow anywhere. If you do that, just make sure you follow whatever advice by you know foragers and people that know good about it what time of year because some of the stuff i know people do eat cattail tubers but i don't know if, i don't really know enough about them to say if there's a time of year where they're not edible or something so and there's a lot of bacteria things that grow in those those uh soils so you got to really be careful so um I was i had brought that one up because i was just thinking like when you're saying oh humans have done so much to the the environment that we have to like take care of the um you know take care of what we've messed up yeah yeah that you know like indigenous people would have been collecting else to eat so and they would have been using controlled burns and they would have been doing all this stuff actually like caretaking and stewardship of the land not just you know letting it be so that's all no, I agree. And that's, you know, like our meadow at our wildlife center, we're actually going to be doing a controlled burn there um, this winter. So bringing back some of those natural processes to have a healthier system that's more more like how it was, you know, and, and obviously the indigenous people um, were great caretakers of the land. But if you go even before them, 
you know, it was lightning and it was um, these herbivores and things like that, that even before humans, you know, we, these systems were in place that we've disrupted so badly in modern era that um, they can't really act naturally. So we have to kind of replicate them in a lot of ways and not always successfully, but I think at least we're trying. Um, you know, in most, most people in, you know, Maryland DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, uh, you know, the mentality has changed a lot when we're trying to figure out what were things used to be like, you know, how can we get them back there? I think it's really important. Um, so um, what benefit are bog turtles? So I, I get asked this question a lot about a lot of species. You know, what good are they? And usually it's in a negative. I know you didn't mean it this way, but a lot of times it's in a negative way. Like, oh, why should I care about this? You know, what, is, what do they do for me? Um, and I know that's not what this question is, but I do hear that as well. Um, and it's actually in my film. Um, I interviewed a few biologists that have been working on this species for a long time. And... They don't have a lot of ecological benefit. You know, this turtles are not really food for a lot of things um, you know, by design. Their their shells protect them from becoming prey for a lot of animals. So, um, uh, you know, their eggs feed certain things. Um, they eat things. They eat slugs and worms. And um, but they're not. You know, these turtles are so rare that whatever benefit they might have had, maybe they created tunnels that allow. You know, like gopher tortoises create tunnels that are homes for. You know, there's keystone species that create homes for you know hundreds of other species but the bog turtle yeah maybe it broke up the mud maybe help with plant dispersal seeds or something like that we don't really know from what i've read but um they're beautiful you know and and kind of like art you know or music uh there's an intrinsic kind of value to just these beautiful things that exist and they still exist there's a history there um and one of the things i always tell people is there's an you know, there's a, a pride that comes with not just, you know, people talk a lot about flags and all this stuff and national anthems and all these things that are in our culture and in our different societies we live in now. But I think natural history, you know, it, there's this weird thing where people are not as, they don't have the same pride and they should, you know, these things are part of this landscape. They're part of its history. Um, human history, since, you know, the indigenous people were here, um, there's some talk that these turtles were actually some of these weird spots on this map. Um, it's possible they actually, these turtles could have been there because of indigenous people actually giving these turtles as gifts. Um, there's been some records of indigenous people transporting turtles in back. I mean, sometimes they would be eaten because they live a long time and with very little, um, you know, sailors used to do that too with tortoises. Um, but you can actually... Um, these turtles will live a long time and be transported and given as gifts to different tribes and they're these beautiful little things. So it's possible, although there's no evidence of this scientifically, but um, at this point, I'm sure genetics will eventually um, play it all out. But some of these turtles that just show up in these random spots, you know, uh, hundreds of miles away from any other location of this turtle. Is it possible that, you know, early humans moved them there? I don't know. It's kind of fun to think about though, I think sometimes. So I, I think, um, that pride that should come with natural history, things being a part of our landscape. And, you know, just as much as these human made elements, um, you know, that we, oh, there's this building here. That's this amazing thing. It's this building that's been there for a hundred years. And well, there's this animal that's been here for millions of years and it's only found here. I mean, the bog turtle is only found in Eastern North America. That's the only place in the world it's found and it ever has been found. So that's pretty special, you know, I, I think so. So I think there should be more of that kind of pride. Um, you know, and, and looking at, uh, you know, we talk about protecting things too. You know, a lot of people say, what do I care about protecting some animals found in some other state? You know, the red wolves in North Carolina, for instance. Why do I care about the red wolf in North Carolina? I don't live there. Well, it's part of our heritage as, as American residents or citizens of America too. You know, and it's, um, it's part of that history, you know, so I think it's important. Hopefully that was a good answer, but that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. Uh, I don't know a lot about cattails, so sorry I'm not really answering that one. Um, but uh, as far as harvesting anything goes, I just always say do it in moderation. Paw paws, anything like that. We we do some paw paw stuff every year. We have a festival of paw paws we just had a few weeks ago. Um, just just take enough for yourself and always leave some for replenish uh, what's there. Um, but some of these species like cattails, they've become pretty widespread and. To potentially invasive in some spots. So um, I don't think they're in the magnolia bogs. So they're only in um, 
Apparently in Har uh, Hartford, Cecil, um, Carroll, and uh, Baltimore counties, northern parts of those counties right now. And the baby, so adorable, so tiny. So here's a little poster from my film. This is not out yet. Uh, I had it at a film festival and then I kind of scrapped it and re I'm redoing the whole thing to make it more um, comprehensive. So that'll be, look out for that. It should be out next year in some different outlets. Uh, it should be pretty, pretty fun to watch if you want to learn more about the species. So I know we're running out of time. So I'm going to kind of go through these other ones a little quickly um, since we talked a lot about some of these themes are, are really are more repetitive. So I can go a little faster through these. So. Uh, the spotted turtle is another, it's not endangered or threatened in Maryland yet. Uh, it's being petitioned for the Federal um, Endangered Species Act. Um, they're not quite as rare as some of these other animals. They're a little more generalist. They just like really shallow wetlands, but they're not as uh, specific as bog turtles. But um, one of the biggest issues with them is they're small and they're beautiful. Uh, that makes them highly collectible. And in Maryland, it's illegal to take a spotted turtle from the wild and keep it as a pet. You can have one if it's captive born, um, but you can't take them out of the wild. Um, and people do that and they sell them uh, on, the, on the black market and often overseas. And there's been a few prominent, um, you can Google it, but there's been a few prominent turtle busts uh, that have been in the news lately where people have taken you know, dozens or hundreds of these animals of all, all different types of native turtles and bringing good money overseas. Um, and, you know, luckily people are getting caught and they're getting fined and put in jail and things like that. So it's starting to have some repercussions to it, but it's been going on for a long time and, and it can completely decimate some of these populations. Um, um, so if someone asked if we should go to every bog. So this turtle, most, the bog turtle mostly lives in these special fens. They're most all on private land. Um, so the state is actively monitoring all the sites that are known um, and working with some partners to do that. So um, I think they're in good hands right now. And it's not a lot we as individuals can do other than supporting organizations that study them. And uh, uh, they're so sensitive. I mean, you can't even legally pick one up without a permit in Maryland so, or federally. So uh, all the work we do is with permits. Um, I, I wanted to mention too, I didn't say it earlier, um, as I'm talking about poaching, one of the things you'll see us do is we'll never mention a rare species location past the uh, county level that it's found. And the reason for that is if we say, oh, I was at this park, I was at, uh, you know, Susquehanna State Park and I found XYZ. Um, what you're doing is you're putting in writing online, especially people do it on Facebook all the time. Um, and I, I, I help co um, uh, uh, monitor or moderate uh, a reptile and amphibian page in Maryland with um, some colleagues and people constantly posting, oh, I found this at blah, 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 just like you do with a bird. But we're like, well, you can't do that with reptiles because people, poachers look for those sorts of things. They actually look for people posting locations with iNaturalist naturalist and uh, Facebook, things like that. Um, and people do it innocently most of the time, but you know, you're giving a poacher essentially a treasure map where they can find that animal and potentially go take it. Um, so we never like to give anything closer than the county level. Um, so just keep that in mind. If anyone's asking questions, don't mention, um, uh, sorry, real quick. Um, don't mention anything more than the county level. If you're asking a question, don't say, oh, I was at my backyard and I found a spotted turtle. You know, don't, don't tell me that, please. <laughs> you can tell me offline if you have questions about that sort of thing. I don't mind. We can talk about that sort of thing confidentially, but. Um, we don't want to talk about it uh, openly in public. Um, so we did research on these spotted turtles, beautiful habitat, mostly vernal pools and marshes, things like that. Um, coastal areas, they're a lot, lot more prevalent coastal areas. Um, and this is my colleague, Hunter Howe. He published three or four papers out of this population study. It's really cool. One about road mortality and how much it affects this population. We compared the study from one in the 80s that was done, the same population. So we found some animals that were marked in the 80s. We're able to see them now and see how they were doing. Um, but the, the unfortunate part was the research showed us that the population had declined um, potentially less, almost to a third of what it was back in the 80s. And this is one of those sites where I always like to bring up because there's this uh, false sense of security that we get a lot of times at our good sites. You know, somewhere where you go and see an animal 
and you can find it with relative ease, you think, oh, that population is doing great. This particular site had, you know, over 100 of these turtles, which is a lot of spotted turtles, right? Well, back in the 80s, it had over 400. So that's a major decline. And that, that's not a, a singular event. That's a steep, keep going kind of decline. You know, there was probably poaching that happened there. The habitat's gotten worse, it's got more shaded. So we're already actively helping to manage the site a little bit, opening up, adding more nesting areas, protecting some road crossings, as you mentioned, some silt fencing kind of stuff, and trying to see if we can give it a little bit of a boost um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's why we have, we can't treat anything as if it's stable and just okay. Uh, we have to learn more about these things. That's why scientific research is so important. And long-term research is important. You can't just, there's not much you can learn about turtles in two years. They're such long-lived species. You really got to see what they're doing for quite some time to really um, get a good handle on how they're doing. You know, you got to see if, because one year you might have bad weather events, you might have diff, you know dry year, wet year, hot year. Um, so nesting could be different each year. And then, uh, but long term, you know, turtles are doing pretty badly. So that's why all these mitigation efforts are really important. And I'll keep going here. Um, uh, so the other species that we're spending a lot of time with the wood turtles. This is one of my favorite species. I'll, I'll probably say it every time I see anything here. But um, uh, the wood turtle is a, a semi-aquatic, so it spends time on on land um, mostly during the summer, and it forages, moves out to the forest. Uh, but in the fall, the spring and fall and winter, it's actually in our kind of freshwater, clean, cold streams. Um, really cool species. Um, and right now we're working with uh, Maryland DNR. Um, we were just out uh, last week uh, in Western Maryland where these turtles are a little more common. Um, they're pretty rare in Hartford County and pretty isolated population. So we're trying to find out more with their, how they're doing out there. Um, but this is a really cool species that's being petitioned for the federal endangered species list as well. Um, they've declined pretty sharply across most of the range, mostly New, the New England and the Great Lakes. Um, they're also a little more of a cold kind of northern species. They go all into Canada, poached, just like the other turtles. You hear a lot of these themes over and over again. Um, you see the male with the larger head on the left and the female with the uh, little bit smaller head on the right here. Um, and you'll see that a lot of these turtles are uh, missing limbs. Uh, they get eaten off by probably raccoons, mink, things like that, raccoons, especially when they're hibernating. So a lot of these turtles are these, these warriors that we find, you know, they could be a 50 year old turtle missing three legs and still surviving somehow, you know, as they're really incredible and resilient animals. Um, so we're studying them right now, trying to get a better understanding of what the population looks like in Maryland. Um, and some new technology that we're a part of um, that we just learned last week when we got training, it's eDNA sampling. So we're actually using this uh, new device. We actually sample the water in a stream uh, downstream, and we um, pull that water out of the stream and go through these special filters that are then sent off to a lab. Uh, in, this, in this case, it's going to be the Smithsonian Institute that we're working with. Uh, and they actually can detect the turtle's DNA in the samples if it's there. So it's a way of checking a stream without having to dig around and find these really you know, hard to find animals uh, in the water. We can actually sample the water, send it off to a lab and say, okay, we at least know presence or absence this turtle is here somewhere in the system and then that can lead to protections that can lead to more research funding things like that so pretty That's cool pretty and innovative, cool innovative technology. technology is that from their excretion or secretion or yeah yeah uh -huh. so um i'll mention it in a minute but uh, we're also doing the same we did the same thing with hellbenders um so you know uh, reproductive material urine feces just skin stuff like that so you know, there's, there's still a lot of um, questions about how far they need to be from from you, the point of uh, of sampling, to um, really depend on uh, um, whether you uh, you can actually detect it or not. Um, I gotta blow my nose. I'm gonna be. Thank you. Sorry, about that. I don't want to gross you all out. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so um, can I make a comment on that federal? Sure. Um, it's it's very important not only to report where it is found, but also where it is not found. When I worked at the Office of Endangered Species, where it is no longer found or not found was the more important factor. It is, yeah. So, so you report where you did not find it, you looked for it. Yep, exactly. So yeah, um, we're looking at a especially in Hartford County here. We're serving a lot of streams that we think are um, historic spots. So we'll we'll be able to determine 
that they're no longer there, which is, you know, no data is good data too. So, I mean, it's negative, it's depressing data, but it's, um, it's important, it's valuable. So uh, we want to know where they no longer occur and why. Okay, the stream, you know, there's a lot of agriculture upstream, it got sedimented out, uh, deforested, it's polluted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are all important things. There's a big road went in right next to it. So um, those are important elements for us to, to learn. So, so another um, state endangered reptile is the map turtle. So this is a species that Towson University spent a lot of time with, uh, putting uh, radio transmitters and tracking these turtles, find out where they nest, where they, what they eat, um, where they bask. Uh, and, and this is a species that has been greatly affected by the Conowingo Dam. Uh, so the dam creates unnatural levels of water that rise up and it actually covers over these basking rocks um, that you'll see in these pictures. Uh, when these basking rocks are not exposed, the turtles don't have uh, places they can bask. They need to bask to help grow eggs inside the females, to uh, process their food, um, raise their temperatures up. So there's a lot of impacts potentially on these species by not having basking rocks, um, as well as they can't move. So this turtle is found up through Pennsylvania and, and the populations are, are uh, segregated by the dams. So they can't move up and down. So the genetics are isolated um, and those sorts of things. So um, I'll keep going so we can cover more stuff. Uh, the hellbender I mentioned, this is a two foot long salamander that used to be found in the lower Susquehanna region um, that is still found out in Western Maryland in Garrett County in Maryland, but also along the Appalachians and uh, northern parts of Susquehanna, like north of Harrisburg and things like that. But it actually used to be found in our region of the Susquehanna um, some time ago. Um, uh, some of the nicknames that I always like to tell people is uh, snot otter. Um, you could call me that right now. I'm sorry for my snotty nose. Uh, but uh, old lasagna sides, uh, you know, Grampus, all these weird names. Uh, fishermen used to think they were venomous and they a lot of times would kill them when they would catch them on a hook. And they also thought that they ate all the trout. So they thought they were competing for trout. Um, so a lot of these animals were killed unnecessarily, but they actually mostly eat crayfish. They are harmless. They don't hurt people. Uh, they're really incredible indicators of healthy streams. A lot of the acid mining stuff and all that um, destruction upstream in a lot of our mountains has caused these animals to go away. And uh, you know, water quality is a big problem for them. They need really cold, really clean water. Uh, there are definitely environmental indicators like a lot of salamanders are. Um, so our part of it um, was to kind of go out and try to find if there's any more habitat left in Cecil and Hartford County. And then we actually, we did an old school way of eDNA before we had those fancy backpacks that I showed you earlier, but we actually scooped up water and sent, uh, we'd filter the water uh, through a special filter in a lab. And then we sent it off to a lab um, in partnership with the Smithsonian. So we did not find any hellbenders in the lower Susquehanna in Maryland, um, not for not trying. We spent about three years doing that, um, almost four. Um, we did not find any. It doesn't mean they're not there, it just means you know, through our efforts, we did not find any and they haven't been seen since you know, probably 50 or 60 years uh, at best. Um, so the dam, a lot of destruction, farming, deforestation, deforestation probably wiped them out. How long do they live? 40, 50 years, I think. From what I understand, so pretty long time. Life was pretty well lived, so that's why I think you might get one or two individuals that lasted. And so and I've had reports even in the '80s where someone said, "Oh, I saw one ex at this spot," and then you know, we no one's seen one since. It could be, uh, you know, no one ever has photos of these things. It's always, you know, and people see eels and other things. You never know what they actually saw, but you know, I think it's possible. Some of the spots they found them, you know, were possible. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's going on now in Garrett County and a lot of places throughout the range, New York and Pennsylvania, they're putting out these artificial nest boxes, which kind of get around the problem of um, the sediment from these streams getting under the rocks they nest under and chokes them out in a lot of these natural systems. So what a lot of researchers have started doing is they make these concrete nest boxes that face downstream. So when the sediment's rushing downstream, it doesn't fill up under the rocks like it normally would under a large boulder, which they need to, um, you know, a flat rock or a boulder. So it kind of gets around that issue without having to clean the whole stream up, which is, you know, could be multiple decades in order to get to that point. And they've been pretty successful. The hellbenders actually go in them. The female lays the eggs, the male guards them, and guards the young, um, you know, in the fall. So uh, they've been pretty successful. They've had some limited success in Western Maryland, but it seems like uh, other places in the range 
have uh, been pretty successful. So um, we're hoping to one day, um, maybe, be able to do this in uh, the Lower Susquehanna, where we are. So if the streams are clean enough, you know, it's possible, maybe one day we can restore them there too. So it's being done up in New York right now and in other places in the range, it's being perfected. So they're trying to find out the best way to do these things. So we have hope for that too. So not, not everything's depressing. It's possible to bring back some of these animals. So um, moving on to amphibians, uh, I know we got about 15, 10, 15 minutes, if everybody's still doing okay. Um, the Eastern tiger salamander is a uh, endangered salamander. It's on the Eastern shore of Maryland. It's mostly found in, Kent, in Caroline County. And we've gone out with Maryland Department of Resource, Natural Resources in uh, typically the winter. <laughs> the salamander tends to breed uh, anywhere from December through March. And we've actually, you can see us in the picture here, us actually breaking through the ice to walk through these pretty deep, uh, what they're called Delmarva Bays. So these are rain-filled depressions in the ground. They used to be called whale wallows because they'd find these big ponds in the middle of a you know, farm field. Uh, and they're like, they thought that it was during a flood and you know, a uh, biblical flood and then these whales were left there and wallowing around or something like that. But these depressions in the ground um, actually catch rainwater and will fill up in, the, in, in good years. So that's why snow is important here that fills them up from snow melt heavy rains in the fall fills them up um and these animals will cross roads on rainy nights and then they'll go and they'll mate you'll see these little glowing egg masses floating in these wetlands so we actually go out and count the egg masses we help dnr do this um and that kind of gives us an indication of how the populations are doing and this is these are sites actually that have been managed by the state once again Active management is really critical to a lot of these species. So they've actually gone in and removed trees from a lot of these wetlands and opened them up so they're more sunny. So they get more sun exposure. The, they tend to lay more eggs. And these salamanders really do a lot better uh, in these managed uh, wetlands. Um, and there have been pretty significant increases in some of these populations over the years, thanks to um, the management of the state. Beautiful animals. They're huge. These huge salamanders. And you see the size of our glove and this beautiful uh, salamander there. Uh, the other species uses the same habitat, actually, uh, the Delmarva bays, the barking tree frog. So some of these animals we have in Maryland, and I'll talk the next couple I'll pass through real quick. Um, they're only rare. I mean, they have specific habitat, but a lot of these animals are rare because we're what I, you know, best way to describe it is edge of range. So they're either found more west, north, or south, and we just happen to be at that cross section where the range map just kind of barely slivers through Maryland. Like the narrow mouth toad is an endangered species in Maryland because it only has a few populations in Maryland. But you go to Virginia and North Carolina, I mean, they're literally everywhere. Like if you go to the Outer Banks and you're staying at one of the beach houses down there, they'll literally be out in the roads and like, like on the beach and like under pieces of trash that are laying on the sand. And like, they're so common, they're like everywhere. Um, but in Maryland, they're endangered species because once again, they don't go any further north. We're right at that edge where it's, you know, Southern Maryland is kind of more like the South, you know, it's more like Virginia. Uh, Northern Maryland's more like Pennsylvania. So you have this pretty big separation, which we're actually lucky in Maryland to have that much of a cross section of, of these uh, ecological um, zones that kind of cross all on that fall line. Um, we have both. So I, I kind of love it because I can go be in the coastal plain and see a totally different species and drive 15 minutes and be in a totally different ecosystem uh, in some ways. It's kind of cool. Uh, but so some of these animals, like I said, they're rare. Maybe it's not because of really environmental factors. It might be just more that we're on the edge of the range. Same with these. There may be some threats to them in different ways, but like the rainbow snake, we're the northernmost state where they come. So they're right near the Potomac, right above just a little sliver of Maryland where they're found. Um, so there's not many of them in Maryland. And, and some of these ranges might actually expand thanks to climate change. One of the few benefits is some of these animals might actually do better in a little warmer climate. They'll move a little bit further north and have a little bit of expansion. Um, and then some of these are the last three, the, the mountain earth snake and the coal skink and the uh, spotty soft shell are all like far Western Maryland, like Garrett County. Um, so I think they're, once again, they're endangered because there's they're only in that plateau and they're kind of really far off to the very uh, outskirts of Maryland at this point. Um, so just um, about snakes real quick. Um, 
snakes are unnecessarily feared and, and persecuted, um, uh, rare or not. Um, they're just, as a species, they, they are declining in a lot of ways um, because people just hate them and they just kill them when they see them. So actually all snakes in Maryland are protected by law. So it's actually illegal to kill snakes, which we tell people that. Most people don't care about that fact, but uh, if they're gonna kill them anyways, but a lot of people will chop off the heads of a snake because they think they're all venomous. Uh, they're all bad. They're evil, whatever reason people say, but um, they're incredibly important for the, uh, the ecosystem. They control rodents in a way that almost no other species can. Even if you think of cats and eagle, uh, owls and hawks and things that eat rodents, foxes, very few of those animals can actually get into a tiny rodent den. Very few of those animals can actually get under a log into a den of mice and actually eat them. And mice carry you know, Lyme disease and a lot of other diseases that affect us and, and become out of balance when there's too many of them. Uh, so snakes are really good to have around. Um, and like I said, they're really interesting species. The more you learn about snakes and all the diversity we have in Maryland, we only have two venomous species, the timber rattlesnake and the uh, uh, eastern copperhead. Do you have a question? Have a question? So we do a lot of education around um, helping snakes and we've rescued a bunch of them, like caught in garden netting. That's another thing that legislation wise, we'd love to see change. Um, we haven't put much steam behind it, but we've advocated for it a few times is that this uh, landscape netting that is often used in construction for sod and putting down new grass, uh, notorious for trapping snakes. Um, I've rescued probably at least a dozen of myself alone out of this stuff and had to cut them out. Uh, we've gotten calls. One was even a copperhead. That was an interesting situation. You can see that on our Facebook page <laughs> a couple years ago. Uh, but we had to put a tube over it and cut the netting off of it, and release it. Um, so one of the things I tell people, if you tell your neighbors, you see someone's like, oh, I'm going to kill the snake. It's on my property. I can get rid of it. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a joke, but we say, you know, hose instead of a hoe, because a lot of people will kill the snake, chop its head off. But if you want a snake to leave your yard, it's really as simple as if you spray it lightly and gently with a hose, they'll typically turn around and just slither off your property. Um, you don't have to hurt snake. You don't have to pick it up. You don't have to know how to pick it up. You only have to know what kind it is. Um, it's just a way of kind of getting it to leave if you don't want it there. Um, I like them around personally, but a lot of people don't. We understand that. So it's just a way of kind of educating people to kind of live alongside snakes in their backyards. Um, there's a big myth on whether we have cotton mouths and water moxes in Maryland or not, and we do not. Um, and we have more information on this on our website, but uh, uh, the cotton mouths are only found in Southern Virginia and further South. They're not found in Maryland. And a lot of people, oh, my uncle said he saw one, he worked for DNR and et cetera, et cetera. But literally we've never seen a confirmation photo of a cotton mouth in Maryland. Um, they're not a, uh, um, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, think they see something that's a northern water snake, a much more common and harmless species. Um, I was asked um, the UN, the UN, U, IUCN red list. Um, yeah, so um, I didn't cover every animal that's on that list necessarily, but a lot of these like spotted wood turtles are considered endangered on the IUCN list. Um, they tend to be a lot, they consider something endangered that's not listed. So we when we talk about endangered species, we typically talk about state or federal listing because it actually holds weight as far as protection of habitat. Uh, if something's just considered rare by scientists that are declining, that's important to note, but it doesn't hold any weight as far as legalities or protections or um, even a lot of times funding. So um, that's why a lot of these species are petitioned. To Scott, it, it actually has frequently held weight. For example, we found on the international list a snail that was globally endangered and, and it was not on the federal state list, but we used it to save Chapman Forest from the largest development in Maryland. It was a key thing that helped save it. And uh, now it is on the state and federal list. But so there are many examples where I'm aware of <laughs> that the IUCN list gives you a start with something that has considered less. We found <laughs> when William Meady gave his talk, we found out they actually are endangered species of mushrooms in, mm -hmm. in America, and we checked it out, and it turns out they are. They're just not on our list yet. <laughs> so it is a useful tool to get started. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. Um, thank you for that. So, yeah, it's important starting point. Well, I mean, still, you know, that's the state has rankings, too. So if you look at the state of Maryland, 
they have like S1, S2, S3, S4, um, that might indicate that this you know, animal is becoming rare. It's a watchlist species. It's in need of conservation, um, but it might not have legal weight yet, um, but it tells you that it's rare. Um, and it needs to be, and the state prioritizes those things for, uh, for you know, research dollars and, and funding and um, also just for level of effort, right? So uh, it is important, but yeah, like I said, for as far as like, you know, having legal repercussions and things like that, um, it's a starting point, but it, you know, those, those actual state and federal listings are really important. Um, in, so I'll, In or, this case though, that snail that was the only habitat in the whole world, it turned out uh, a teenager had found it 20 years earlier at that site. Wow. So um, it did work. That's great. Yeah, it's great to hear that. Um, so um, do we still have a couple minutes? I want to go through this last part. Are we okay? I know we're almost at nine. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, that netting is terrible. Yeah, thanks for the comment on that. Yeah, it's, it's something that I would like to see legislate at some point because there are other states that I believe have um, to get rid of some of that netting. There's other more biodegradable alternatives in that plastic netting. It's just, it's so bad for wildlife. Um, so kind of the last thing I'll go through real quick is our copperhead study. Now it's not a rare or a necessarily endangered or threatened species, but it is a highly persecuted species. So I thought it was important to mention this. So we had actually um, done a two year uh, study um, on the defensive behavior of copperheads. So this is, uh, in most of Maryland, this is our only uh, venomous snake. Um, you know, once you get to Frederick and West, you have uh, timber rattlesnakes as well. But uh, for most of Eastern Maryland, um, you know, uh, now uh, there were rattlesnakes in the past, but uh, now the copperhead's the only one. So, and across the east, uh, Eastern United States, the copperhead is the main uh, snake that is responsible for bites and most the most common venomous snake people run into in most parts of the uh, Eastern United States. So, we wanted to um, uh, we wanted to figure out um, how likely these animals were to actually strike, because everyone says, "Oh, they're terrible. They're they're aggressive, and you know, watch out for copperheads. They're going to come after you, and like the boogeyman kind of thing." Um, so we're like, we knew from our experience that we've been around copperheads doing other research. We said, "You know, I almost never see a copperhead strike, but let's put that to a test. Let's go out and do research." So. Um, so we actually went out and we took temperatures. We'd find copperheads. Um, we'd actually lightly place a boot next to and then on the snake without hurting it, of course. Um, and then if it didn't flee, uh, it stayed in put, we'd actually pick it up with a set of tongs with a glove on it. Now, obviously, when you do use a real foot, you can see there's a pole there. Um, and what we do is record, you know, did the animal rattle its tail? Did it flee? Did it strike? Did it do nothing at all? Um, I thought another slide there. Um, so the results of that um, two-year study, and we found uh, almost seventy snakes. Um, we only had two strike out of almost seventy copperheads. So the idea that this is an aggressive beast that's waiting in the woods to attack you was just, um, by all accounts, wrong. Um, the snake does bite people, and, and I always have to add that caveat because the snake is. Um, unlikely to bite people during this is uh this uh experiment was to replicate the normal interaction people have with them while say hiking um i i've personally know people that have been pulling up a tarp or digging in a wood pile and gotten bit by a copperhead it happens um but that's when the animal doesn't feel like it can escape if it's in a trapped area and it can't leave um they're very likely to strike in those situations in our situations that we were experimenting on this was the animal that's sitting on the side of a trail sitting on a rock outcrop and we just would bump into it the, the shoe you know step on it lightly now if someone puts their full weight on it it's going to strike them because they're the snake's feeling pain so it's probably going to strike um but what we wanted to say is like you're just walking you bump it in with the shoe you, you walk past it and don't even see it which is the most common thing because they're they're relying on their camouflage um so they don't want to strike and give up their location because that's how they get eaten you know even if they strike something like a you know a fox or a coyote um, that, that animal may have time to eat it before it even feels the effects of the venom. So they don't want to give up their, their uh, location um, at all. So uh, it's pretty interesting um, you know, what we're able to find from that. We got this study published, so you can look at it on our website, um, uh, suskywildlife.org, and I'll show that at the end here. Uh, but that's one of those just examples of the products we're trying to advocate for a species 
that is feared or hated. Um, and people kill these things all the time. Um, help people identify them better. You know, they have these Hershey Kiss uh, markings on the side, we like to say, um, that's pretty identifiable. Looking strictly at their head shape or um, is not, and color is not always a good way of identifying a venomous snake because a lot of snakes do have wide heads or can mimic having a wide head. So just one of the things that we do, um, I think was pretty interesting and pretty valuable uh, to help advocate for this kind of un undesired species. Um, and then just to kind of close, we have some merch online. You can check out if you like turtle stuff and we have some other uh, different designs on our um, merch store. You can see that on our website. Um, and then a uh, couple upcoming programs we have, uh, Fall Colors Paddle. We have still a few spots left. If any of you are into kayaking uh, and you want to come up and join us on Halloween, it's one, I think it's one to four o'clock. So it won't be at night to interfere with trick-or-treating with kids or anything. But um, we'll be out on a beautiful creek uh, and enjoying the fall colors. And hopefully there's some left after all this rain. Uh, and then uh, we typically do a Black Friday opt-out kind of hike that kind of REI started doing. Uh, we do that usually at the Wildlife Center. So we'll be advertising that soon if you follow us on social media. And then uh, we do a lot of other cool programs the rest of the year too. We've done creek snorkeling and um, different hikes and kayaking trips, things like that. Uh, we do a pawpaw festival. Uh, we just did that early October. It was really fun. We had lemonade and pawpaw products. Um, people could buy whole pawpaw fruit and try it out. We had trees for sale. And uh, best of all, pawpaw ice cream was really delicious. So it was uh, made on a local dairy that raises the cows right there and made uh, ice cream for us with uh, real pawpaw fruit. So pretty cool. We do some fun stuff. So definitely try to follow us and keep an eye on what's coming. Um, we do an Amazon thing and then um, just some of our social media. That's really it. Um, if anyone's still here and wants to ask a couple of questions, I'm glad to do that. Uh, sorry, I ran over a little bit. It's been really, really great.